You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 14, 2017, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Pathogenesis of Human Asthma. Our presenter is Dr. Lanny Rosenwasser. Dr. Rosenwasser is a past president of the World Allergy Organization. and immune responses within the airway as a major cause of this uh, obstruction, and increased airways responsiveness to a variety of stimuli, agonists such as methicoline, as well as natural exposures to things like cold air or exercise, etc. all increased airway responsiveness. Next slide. There was, for the first time, a pathology that was associated with this <coughs> definition. Are we on the next slide yet? Because we're not yes. out here. So uh, the next slide under, underlies the immunohastopathologic features of asthma, denudation of airway epithelium, collagen deposition beneath the basement membrane and, ba and airway thickening, so-called um, uh, remodeling, edema, mast cell activation, and inflammatory cell infiltration, predominantly neutrophils, eosinophils, and lymphocytes, which were deemed to be predominantly these Th2 type of lymphocytes that were uh, in the uh, in the airway uh, by biopsy and, and the like. Remodeling went along with it, airway wall thickening with subepithelial fibrosis, increased myocyte mass, myofibroblast hyperplasia, and mucus metaplasia and excess mucus. Uh, airway remodeling is an important characteristic. It's hard to define because there's no specific one specific biomarker associated with it, but um, it's an important concept because it's associated with hyper-responsiveness. The consequences of airway remodeling leads to some physiologic changes. In some individuals, there's irreversible or only partially reversible airway obstruction. And then this gets into the issue, which we won't go into in detail, of an overlap between asthma and COPD, where there is clearly um, irreversible airway obstruction due to other kinds of mechanisms, not just the asthmatic mechanisms. And distinguishing these two different types of issues, the so-called um, uh, asthma COPD overlap syndrome, or ACOS, uh, is a very difficult thing. Some people think that there's no distinction, the so-called Dutch hypothesis of asthma. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's an important thing in respiratory biology and respiratory medicine. Airway hyperresponsiveness is clearly probably the main physiologic uh, uh, function associated with the effect of remodeling. And what is found is in asthmatics, even those who've never smoked, if you compare non-smoker asthmatics to non-smoker controls, they have a greater yearly decline in FEV1. So all of us, when we reach the age of 20, we're at the height of our FEV1 measurements. And with aging, FEV1 generally declines 22 mLs per year. In asthma, that decline is as high as 38 mLs per year. So there's something about asthma that accelerates whatever normal aging processes are in the lung. So there's a difference that way. As of 10 years ago, which was the last time there was an expert panel report of the NAPP uh, from NHLBI, there was a quaint view of pathogenesis that was com not completely correct. The view was that somehow these Th2 inflammation mediated by adaptive immune responses, as you can see on the left of this slide, um, leads to a circumstance that leads to damage to the epithelium uh, and that environmental factors, including allergens, but also viruses, toxins, um, d diesel exhaust, all can influence dendritic cell activation of these adaptive T cells, adaptive immune responses that lead to damage to the epithelium, uh, thickening of the airway uh, because of myofibroblast and fibrosis subepithelially with denudation of the epithelium that leads to the hyperresponsiveness and obstruction, and that somehow this might feed back on the inflammation. So this was a quaint view the last time it was uh, identified 
that put the Th2 response really in the center of an asthmatic response. And that's now clearly not the case. Um, next one. Next slide, please, Charlie. Okay. The more modern the view. Away. Yes. Um, the more modern view of how asthma develops now relegates T cells not to the dominant whole left side of the pathogenesis, but this little area here in this corner. And since I started my scientific life as a T cell biologist, that's a little bit um, distressing, but it's probably closer to the truth. And probably what happens in asthma is that um, changes in the airway epithelium induced by a variety of, ter of materials, and not just these materials, but also the microbiome, if you will, of the, uh, of the airway, that leads to airway epithelial changes that are genetically and epigenetically drawn to generate a response in the airway epithelium that leads to the type of immunity it's now not, no, not just a Th2 immunity through adaptive immune response, responses, but something that in the modern era is known as type 2 immunity, because not only the T cells themselves, but other innate immune responses and other kinds of factors lead to a variety of inflammation that leads to that final part of uh, airway uh, hyper-responsiveness and remodeling uh, that we had talked about. And there are factors involved at both levels. The induction of this um, type 2 immunity uh, skewing, if you will, seems to be mediated by the cytokines TSLP and IL-33. We'll talk a little bit in more detail about IL-33 in this process. And IL-25 has a role, but I don't think it's as important as TSLP or IL-33 in skewing all of these immune cells to a type 2 immune response that leads to the bottom line of this response uh, in terms of airway remodeling. And it's worth keeping in mind that this degree and concept of pathogenesis is not just applied uh, to uh, asthma and the airway epithelium in asthma, but you can make the same kind of argument for atopic dermatitis and the, um, uh, and the changes in the skin, for example, with type 2 immune responses playing some role along with barrier function. Or in the upper airway, in terms of polyposis and rhinitis, nasal polyposis and rhinitis, where the same process is occurring, or in the GI tract in food allergy and EOE. So there's a lot of ways in which this concept of type 2 immunity, not just the adaptive immune response, but the skewing of the innate immune response to a type 2 outcome uh, leads to many of these allergic diseases. We're talking about asthma here, but it's not just the T cell receptor, B cell receptor adaptive response that leads to the inflammation. You can see here with all of these um, uh, pathways of activation through toll-like receptors, IL-1 receptors, um, other receptors, uh, TNF receptors on immune cells, that we get a variety of signaling pathways uh, amplifying the inflammatory response. So these are very complex processes, and they're not just limited to the adaptive immune response, which is the way people thought about it up to about 10 years ago. But all of these factors probably play a role in generating a milieu that leads to a type 2 immune response and eventually asthma when everything else is in place, namely perhaps viral exposure, uh, environmental exposures, um, allergen exposure, etc. Okay, next slide. Let's see what we're up with this one. Oh, as far as the adaptive immune response goes, uh, 20 years ago in the 1990s, the theories were that uh, with allergic diseases and asthma, you had too much Th2 adaptive immune response uh, profiles uh, that overwhelmed the Th1. But when you got a better balance with Th1, such as you might get, for example, by exposure to dirt and the hygiene hypothesis, you actually could overcome the Th2 predominance that one sees in asthmatic uh, or other kind of allergic conditions. Uh, it was a neat theory, but totally wrong. Although the concept of Th1 and Th2 cells hold, and in fact, um, these are important adaptive immune responses involved in host defense and the response to vaccines and other kinds of uh, diseases and hypersensitivity diseases. So Th1 and Th2 hold. 
there are Th17 cells that are now very important because they produce IL-17, which we'll talk about. And all of these adaptive T cells, CD4 T cells, that get generated based on the milieu and the transcriptional activation along with the milieu um, are uh, important, but not the sole answer uh, for most allergic diseases. So for Th17 cells, TGF-beta and IL-6 inducing ROR2A, which is a, a transcription factor in humans, and STAT3 lead to the differentiation of naive CD4 T cells into Th17 cells. One could also get T regulatory cells. We'll talk about their importance in a minute. If you have TGF-beta, IL-2, and activation of FOXP3 and STAT5, these are incredibly important because they can suppress specific responses by a number of these other kinds of cells. All of them can be suppressed by T regulatory cells. Um, so for T regulatory cells, these are clearly important cells that are involved in tolerance, natural tolerance to materials, including allergens, but also with allergen immunotherapy, these get induced and they can suppress and um, negate active CD4 T cells, for example, directed to insect venom uh, uh, epitopes and allergens uh, where IgEs are important. Uh, the expression of TGF-beta and IL-10 is important for these cells that not only have CD4 as a marker, but CD25 as well, and express FOXP3 as a transcription factor, and IL-35 as a unique growth factor for these T regulatory cells. So anything that enhances these T regulatory cells in an allergic response may be very, very important. There are probably a dozen other T cell and T cell related subsets, um, innate NKT cells, NKT cells, gamma delta cells, Th22 cells that are important in psoriasis and atopic dermatitis, Th9 cells that produce IL-9, and in fact, the innate lymphoid cells, which we'll mention in a second, uh, that produce IL-9 as well as these Th9 cells have been shown to be important cells in protecting against experimental models of rheumatoid arthritis and may play, these IL-9 producing cells may play an important role in um, ameliorating joint damage in, um, in human RA in a recently published paper in Nature Medicine. Uh, what was found in the last probably seven or eight years is that there are a group of cells that are called innate lymphoid cells that look to be very similar to the Th1, Th2, and Th17 cells in terms of their cytokine output, but they don't have the receptors for allergens and or uh, foreign proteins that the adaptive Th2, Th1, and Th17 cells uh, have. And in fact, you therefore can have um, a significant response independent of um, expression of a specific T cell receptor. So you can get the same type two immunity without a uh, response to a foreign protein or a specific protein. Now, the whole point of a lot of this, which we've gone through very quickly, is that asthma is a very complex uh, pathogenic uh, entity. There are several orders of magnitude that go beyond the complexities in these cartoons I've shown you. These cartoons occur in two dimensions. Uh, the actual asthmatic responses amongst the cells and in the tissues occur in three dimensions. All of them involve ligands that bind to receptors that then have effects on living cells that are part of tissues. And the microbiome, the proteome, the transcriptome, and the genome all contribute to that from the point of view of the omics and the omics revolution in allergy and asthma. But then tissues, organs, whole body, and even brain can have an effect on how the lung functions, for example, in asthma. And this occurs not just in three dimensions, but in four dimensions as well. So over time, the complexity of this process actually changes. So it seems like it's a hopeless thing to get the final answer to, but people are still moving ahead in spite of that. 10 years ago, when that same mis uh, idea on the pathogenesis occurred, there were step six uh, approaches to uh, managing of asthma put forward by the EPR3 or expert panel. Uh, this hasn't been updated in 10 years, so there's actually some changes. 
But most of the severe asthmatics, the 20% of asthmatics who make up 80% of the healthcare expenditures are in the step four, five, six um, uh, grades. This has been further updated on a more global basis by GINA, Global Initiative in Asthma, uh, that has updated something as of about two or three years ago. And these most severe four, five, six steps are in step four, five GINA. And they're the ones, when you think of severe asthma, you need to think about in terms of treatment and actual potential risk uh, because of severity of disease. And in fact, severe asthma is a special entity that has been studied. Next one, Charlie. Okay, coming up. Okay. In fact, uh, three years ago, two to three years ago, there was a ATSERS task force that defined severe asthma in which um, there was very simple. There were three criteria. If you were on high dose inhaled corticosteroids and a second controller, either a long acting beta agonist or a leukotriene receptor antagonist for the previous year but still had symptoms, uh, you potentially have severe asthma. If you have had systemic steroids, either enough steroid bursts or actually being on daily uh, oral steroids, for example, for about 50% of the year, you're in the severe asthma category. And if you're uncontrolled despite that kind of therapy, either one or two, you have severe asthma. Next one. The uh, definition of control is listed on this next slide, which would be an ACQ less than 1.5, an ACT greater than 20. Uh, anything that identified as uh, 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 uncontrolled asthma by either the NAEP or GINA guidelines. Frequent exacerbations, severe serious exacerbations, and airflow limitation. Not defined at any percentage of FEV1 or, or anything of that sort, but just airway uh, obstruction. Over the years, the long-term control medications are important in getting this chronic uh, disease under control. Inhaled corticosteroids is the main major site or the main cornerstone of this kind of therapy. Leukotriene modifiers can be utilized, especially in the less severe uh, asthmatics. Long-acting beta agonists in conjunction with the inhaled corticosteroids. And long-acting anticholinergics have emerged as an alternative to, uh, and or in addition to the long-acting beta agonist as a potential bronchodilator in these long-term control approaches. Um, for quick relief, short-acting beta agonists are the control rescue medicines. Anticholinergic can be used under these circumstances, and systemic glucocorticoids hopefully can reverse acute exacerbations quickly. So you get to the point of once you've reached this definition of severe asthma and you have these kinds of treatments, what are the next treatments? For the past 10 or 12 years, omalizumab has really been the first step. Historically, there had been attempts with methotrexate and other, uh, other kinds of antimetabolites and or cytotoxic agents that mostly have failed, for example, in severe asthma. Macrolides, for a variety of reasons, uh, which we won't go into today, uh, thinking that there might be a commensal infection in, uh, in asthma, or some actually effects of some of the macrolides themselves as, uh, as a potential um, uh, ac accessory activation material in asthma has been utilized. Antifungal, this is a controversial area, uh, that still is not a, a main point of uh, therapy. Bronchial thermoplasty over the past three or four years has gained some uh, um, approach uh, to treat certain subgroups of asthmatics who do not have significant eosinophilia or the profile that one would associate with response to either omalizumab or some of the newer anti-cytokines that are being uh, utilized. So we'll now talk a little bit about some of the anti-cytokines that are emerging as treatments for severe asthma, as well as asthma in general, uh, because pathogenesis, I think, based on the positive response to these anti-cytokines, suggests that they are critically important in the pathogenesis of asthma. So our first biotherapeutic for asthma was anti-IgE. It had a moderate effect, um, not on all individuals, but many who did. Um, and there are all sorts of rules over the past 10 or 12 years about how to give it. It's clearly had efficacy in asthma, 
uh, to some degree, and many asthmatics respond to it. It's probably got influences on allergic rhinitis, although that's not been a primary indication. It's now acquired another indication for chronic idiopathic urticaria, where it seems to work even better than in asthma. And I think it probably relates to the concept that there's reduced um, IgEFC receptor expression on mast cells for the most part, and that's how the inflammation in asthma and in urticaria seems to get turned down. Uh, but again, this could be a lecture in and of itself and don't really have time to go into some of these details. Next one. There are emer emerging in biotherapeutics uh, in the anti-IL-1 family. And we'll talk about the IL-1 family because that's the, the major interest I've had over the decades related to uh, immunology and also its application to asthma. But uh, anti-IL-5 is an important target. There are now approved medications that block IL-5 activity. Anti-IL-17 we'll touch on at the end if we have time. And anti-IL-13 and anti-IL-4, anti-IL-13 combinations seem to also have some promise. So in the anti-IL-4 materials themselves are probably not of great interest and probably won't be approved in any way. Mepolizumab and reslizumab, as I'll mention in the next few slides, have both been shown to have efficacy in, in eosinophilic asthma. And in fact, they both have been approved by FDA for use in severe eosinophilic asthma. A third anti-IL-5 agent that blocks the IL-5 receptor has a lot, little bit of a different pattern of activity uh, than mepolizumab and reslizumab. I expect they'll be approved by the end of the year. Its data is as strong as the other two. And there's no reason to believe it won't be approved because it does have a good safety profile. One thing and one group of agents that looked very impressive in the beginning but sort of petered out once they got to larger trials, which happens with a lot of this clinical research, have been the agents that block IL-13 alone, lebrokizumab, tralokinumab, and rukinzumab. There's actually one or two more that have been tried. And again, they've been somewhat disappointing in terms of larger phase three trials with asthma. And I'm not sure that any of them will go through to approval for asthma as standalone agents. What looks more impressive is uh, the agents that block both IL-4 and IL-13 by blocking the binding site on the IL-4 receptor alpha protein. And this is known as dupilumab. It was uh, approved for the indication of atopic dermatitis where it's truly had um, a very, very significant uh, and uh, remarkable effect in a severe atopic dermatitis, approved last uh, March and uh, now available for, for severe atopic dermatitis. There was an agent, AMG317, had had a similar to profile, but didn't appear to be as efficacious as the dupilumab, so it's sort of fallen by the wayside. I believe dupilumab within a year will get approved for asthma as well because the data on asthma related to blocking IL-4 and IL-13 um, is very similar to what one sees in, uh, in, in atopic dermatitis. There's an anti-TSLP uh, that's called AMG157 that's now in phase two trials. Um, there was a report two or three years ago now uh, from Canada utilizing this Amgen monoclonal antibody against TSLP and showing that it blocked the late phase response, which is the first step in identifying any biotherapeutic in terms of its efficacy in asthma. Uh, but we haven't seen many reports since then, but I think that there's no question that the anti-TSLP is being considered as an important target to block in asthma. Um, for anti-IL-5, the uh, key features of uh, of IL-5 that um, are involved in enhancing eosinophil activity and inflammation in the airway uh, are delineated in this, uh, in this cartoon. Uh, and the way in which the anti-IL-5s block it is by sopping up the excess ligand of IL-5 and preventing a growth factor required for eosinophil survival. And so the eosinophils therefore go away. Um, and as I said, the benralizumab, which is an anti-IL-5 receptor, has about the same effect. About uh, seven or eight years ago, next slide, there was reports. Uh, well, first of all, 15 years ago, 
there were reports that said that any of the anti-IL-5 agents didn't really work because uh, it had no effect after four weeks of treatment on uh, FEV1, which was the way Peter Barnes used to set up asthma trials for new drugs. In reality, um, all the monoclonal antibody therapies and anti-cytokines generally have to be in place for four to six months for them to have an effect. Um, and the effects are not necessarily on airway function, although that can be seen, uh, but they are on a variety of other effects, namely reduction in exacerbation, as you see here from a couple of studies that came out in the New England Journal that reemerged uh, uh, anti-IL-5 as potentially being a treatment for uh, grasma. Next slide. Just all the characteristics of the other intermediate outcomes uh, that identified uh, IL-5 as an anti-IL-5 blockade as an important function. Did you get the next one there, Charlie? Anti-IL-5 in human asthma. <clears throat> There's one, one, the next one after that has a variety of other other activities. Can you? It hasn't changed on my screen, but no. Well, that's skipped over it. This is now the same kind of effects uh, on um, anti-IL-5 made by. Uh, a different company that had the exact same effect in terms of uh, uh, asthma. Yeah, that's the uh, other characteristics, including some of the effects on uh, airway function that look to be important. Uh, Reslizumab, which is the second uh, anti-IL-5 that had been approved. Next slide. Reslizumab was also shown to have the same effects in asthma. You can go to the next one, Charlie. Okay, Dupilumab. Yeah, we can go all the way to there. I already touched on the reslizumab. So mepolizumab and reslizumab are the two forms of anti-IL-5, really indistinguishable in their effects that had been approved. Um, and uh, benralizumab is going to be available, I think, this year as well. It has a similar profile. Uh, this is the dupilumab effects uh, one published in Lancet for asthma uh, with lead author Sally Wenzel. And the uh, the one on top of that is a New England Journal uh, publication of the the large phase three trial uh, on uh, uh, atopic dermatitis that was actually the basis for the approval through FDA. And as I said, I think the asthma data are just as strong and uh, I think it'll get an indication for asthma within the next year. So anti-IL-4 and anti-IL-13 will be uh, uh, available. One of the big issues about all of these different things is how do you select the patients who are going to get these more expensive therapies? And a lot of it would depend on biomarkers or characteristics of the asthmatics. I mentioned the anti-TSLP is being developed. There's some uh, characteristics of TSLP and activate cells of innate immunity to skew towards type 2 immunity, not just TH2, and its expression correlates with asthma and allergic diseases. Next slide. And this next slide is just the information I mentioned from Canada affecting the late phase response from the New England Journal. So anti-TSLP is something that will be on the future uh, uh, potential. And I'll mention a little bit about anti-IL-33 in a moment, or I'll mention about IL-33 in, in general. Next slide. IL-33 is a member of the IL-1 family. Um, and as I said, my research career started when we were involved in identifying IL-1, and in particular IL-1 beta, as an important uh, factor and actually molecularly cloning it in the 1980s. Um, but we were able to show that uh, IL-1 is a critical cofactor for both uh, for T cells as well as TH2 and TH17 cells in humans and mice. So they clearly may have an important function as a critical cofactor co uh, for asthma. Next slide. We were able to show also that IL-1 beta can be seen in asthmatic lungs now about 25 years ago. IL-1 is made up of, of 11 genes uh, that's known as the IL-1 family. Uh, rather than other names, that's actually the name of the protein, and it's also the property. And what's interesting is these proteins are all part of the innate immune response, 
they, you don't have to have any kind of prior immunity or prior recognition of, of house dust mite or uh, grass or, or ragweed allergen to produce these. Uh, but if you come in contact, for example, with diesel exhaust or if you come in contact um, with uh, endotoxin from bacteria, you might produce these uh, functions uh, in macrophages, dendritic cells, and other cells of the innate immune response. And what's of interest is that these uh, materials are very, very um, related in that there's families of them that are actually pro-inflammatory or pro-active uh, uh, proteins. IL-1 alpha and beta are in this category, as is IL-33, which we'll talk about in more detail. Of interest is IL-37, which acts as a suppressor of IL-1 and IL-18 inflammation, and IL-33 inflammation as well. So IL-37 looks to have some uh, potential benefit. The IL-1 receptor antagonist itself is um, now actually a a, a treatment and has been a treatment for arthritis for about 15 years. It's called anakinra or uh, kinaret, and it's useful uh, in pediatric uh, um, arthritis, juvenile arthritis. Uh, it's also very active in a couple of other more unusual syndromes, such as adult onset stills um, and, uh, and some of the vasculitides. But at any rate, the IL-1 receptor antagonist is actually a medication, as I'll mention. And you can see here how all the different IL-1 families are, uh, aline are delineated. IL-33, like IL-1 alpha and beta, uh, gets cleaved generally by a caspase to the active form of the molecule and goes from 270 amino acids to about 150 amino acids for a full activity. And we'll talk about that for IL-33 in a second. IL-33 is incredibly important for type 2 uh, immune responses and allergic diseases. And like TSLP, it's a major um, trigger for those kinds of responses. OK, next one, uh, Charlie. Um, there are actually FDA-approved blockers for the IL-1 beta. Uh, Rolonicept, canakinumab, and uh, monoclonal antibody and anakinra or kinraret, IL-1-RA, which is all, all of them have been approved for the, um, for the, uh, uh, the CAPS or, uh, you know, the uh, idiopathic pyrogenic uh, syndromes, such as FMF, familial cold or urticaria, uh, muckle wells, et cetera. So IL-1 blockade also plays a role in those circumstances. IL-1 blockade has also been found to be an important factor, potentially, in the treatment of gout and post-MI. Uh, so there are other indications for IL-1 blockade. It's never been looked at in real serious ways in asthma. And I think there are some general uh, aspects of inflammation in, uh, in asthma that might make IL-1 blockade important, although there are many targets that appear to be better than IL-1, including IL-33, as I mentioned previously. Next one, just to go through IL-33 pretty quickly. Um, IL-33 binds to a IL-1 receptor protein called ST2. ST2 is, was actually a marker on Th2 lymphocytes, but activation through IL-33 of the ST2 receptor, which is also known as IL-1, RL-1, along with the IL-1 receptor accessory protein leads to activation within the cells, more cytokine, chemokine release, enhanced degranulation, et cetera. Uh, next one. IL-33 and the IL-1 receptor 1, IL-1, R1, L1, the receptor for IL-33, both have been uh, targets that have uh, come up positive when you look at GWAS studies. The next one's not come up on mine, but the next one should be the GWAS data. I think we've gone now past the GWAS, but both uh, IL-33 and ST2, or the IL-1, RL-1, are genetically linked to human asthma from a variety of GWAS studies published there, as you can see. Uh, IL-33, like IL-1, alpha, and beta, gets um, processed through clipping of the uh, precursor molecule into the full-length active molecule. 
There's actually a review this month in the JACI by Nikai and Saito and some of their colleagues on IL-33. And they like to point out that clipping IL-33, depending on the, on the uh, 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 protease that clips it, whether it's caspase-1, cathepsin, PR3, uh, or other, other proteases, there might be variations in the amino terminus of the, of the IL-1 or IL-33 molecule. And they make a big point of how they have slightly different biological activities based on the different clip points. Um, it's actually uh, less important when you try to block IL-33 with a monoclonal antibody that I'll block all of these different processed process proteins. Um, what's also of interest here is that um, besides cathepsin and elastase and uh, caspase, PR3, which is proteinase 3, the target for ANCA, uh, uh, C ANCA, or excuse me, P ANCA, no, C ANCA, sorry, the one that's positive in GPA uh, also will clip this. So within neutrophils, you could get IL-1 or rather IL-33 processing, but or but macrophages and dendritic cells would do it as well. So IL-33 in epithelium is important. It activates a variety of the immune cells that we normally associate with allergic responses. They're all all summarized here and it becomes an important central mediator. And again, like TSLP, there are anti-IL-33 antibodies that are in phase two trial where the results are not available yet, but we should see them at some point. So beyond the dupilumab, anti-IL-4, anti-IL-13, and the three anti-IL-5s, as well as the omalizumab, uh, I believe we're gonna be having a um, anti-IL-33, anti-TSLP, material within the next five years. Okay, just a word or two about IL-17 pathways because they're probably important, especially in neutrophilic asthma. Next slide. Although the data with IL-17 blockade has been not so not so positive. Do we have, I can't see it, so I don't know which okay, one you're up to there. Okay, I've got CD4 subsets. Yeah, no, that's just a repeat, just a, make sure that we go through the okay. IL-17 pathway. Again, next slide. Okay, now I'm on IL-17. Right, it's a um, family of six proteins, IL-17A to F. IL-17E is IL-25, which is part of the terumbrate of uh, epithelial cytokines that skew towards a Th2 response and a type two immune response, um, but, um, <clears throat> The, uh, uh, all of them are associated with pro-inflammatory responses. IL-17A and F are the ones that are most active in uh, inducing other chemokines or chemokines and fibrosis. Uh, and the genetics of the whole family is linked to asthma. Next one. There's antibodies that target IL-17 itself, the IL-17 receptor and the IL-6 receptor. And they've all been approved for treatment of uh, psoriasis. So I think ixakizumab is actually TALTS. So if you watch television, there's a million, a million uh, advertisements for TALTS, but all these other ones are also approved for psoriasis, bertalimab and tocilizumab as well. So they all cover the possibility of TH17 linked blockade. Next slide, the early results on blocking TIL17 in allergic diseases actually was actually very poor and a bunch of the companies have dropped uh, uh, further studies in of IL-17 blockade and asthma. There seemed to be a, a signal of increased depression with that kind of treatment. I, I believe that's a spurious association, but the lack of efficacy and the, co the possibility as if a red flag about this depression marker came up with any of these anti-IL-17 agents which are also now all approved for psoriasis. So their potential market, according to all these different companies like Amgen and Novartis and uh, AstraZeneca, makes IL-17 less than it, of an attractive target uh, for treating asthma. Next slide, there's a variety of reasons why that may be the case besides these economic reasons, which I've attributed to these companies. 
Yeah, I go to the next one, uh, Charlie. That's uh, IL-17. Yeah, IL-17 may be an epiphenomenon. Its association with disease is not necessarily um, involved in pathogenesis. The wrong stratification, wrong patient selection, inappropriate endpoints, all are important uh, in situations. And there may be drug-related deficiencies, the wrong dose, wrong dosing regime, wrong selection of patients. Uh, it may be that there may be a biomarker for the IL-17 that makes it important. So in terms of uh, pathogenesis of asthma and its treatment, our current state of the art on asthma pathogenesis is that we need big data to understand the complex factors that I had talked about previously. And there are many schemes and cascades that get generated with that kind of high tech throughput of data. Next one. This is one of these uh, slides that have, you know, multiple uh, multiple steps. Because so I think I I stole it from Steve Galley. Next one. Uh, deficit should be up, and things to do should be up also. Yeah, that, I don't see them, but whatever that is, what we need eventually will be a um, a mathematical model to look at all these different potential pathways and cascades. And it may be that there's no one kind of pathogenesis for asthma. It may be that there's a dozen, or maybe a hundred, or maybe even a thousand different forms of the disease that can get you to asthma. And that's why it's important to get this big data throughput and analyze it in a precision medicine kind of way to figure it out. But I think um, when I started out thinking about asthma pathogenesis, many people thought I was crazy to think that these cytokines played a major role. But I think that these anti-cytokine therapies over the last 20 years or so make um, a cytokine basis of this risk of this disease highly likely. And I think that eventually we'll be able to figure out which patients will do better with which um, uh, anti-cytokine approach. That's our hope for the future here. Next one. Let's go to the end quickly. Um, the uh, the uh, I made a bunch of predictions in 2004 when I was president of Quad AI about what the um, what allergy and asthma would look like in 2030, and I think you know it still holds. We're about half of the way there from when I was president, and I think uh, all of these things are eventually filling into place. And if not all, if, if all of them are not really there by 2030, they will be by I think by 2050. So. Uh, you know, this is what I think the future of asthma pathogenesis will look like. I hope I didn't bore you with all these cytokines and different things. For the new fellows, it's a little daunting to start out, but I'm sure with all the uh, teaching you're going to get from Nikki and, uh, and Nia that you'll probably be able to pick up on all these innate and adaptive immune response pathways without any difficulty. And uh, if you ever have any questions, you can email me. Uh, Charlie has my email, as does uh, Paul. So I'd like to also uh, say that uh, if you have important information and or interesting case reports that produce uh, new ways of thinking, the WOW Journal will certainly consider them. It's, uh, I think, an up-and-coming journal in the allergy world. Um, we are expecting an impact factor shortly. Uh, it's all open access, and it's all uh, it's in PubMed Central. So all of the uh, papers that get published are well well received and accessed and easily accessed accessed for downloading. So the Wow Journal is a good place for you to think about your work. Um, and I'll be glad.